In the early 2000s, Microsoft's Xbox 360 console was on top of the world. Launched in November 2005 to great acclaim, it was the first of the seventh generation of consoles and the first to have high definition graphics, online gaming and a social entertainment network. It would be another year before Sony would release the Xbox's arch nemesis, the PlayStation 3. So it had a good run in that time to get a real foothold in the market. And when PlayStation 3 came out at a much larger price, <laughs> they practically handed the seventh generation to Microsoft. But then something unexpected appeared coming over the horizon. Something from a cheeky little startup company called Nintendo. Only joking Nintendo, please don't sue me. This strange, unassuming little white box would bring something new to the world of gaming, motion sensing controllers. Now you sit there thinking, Nothing new about that. It had been tried before. Yes, this is true, but prior attempts have been, let's be honest, quite poor. But with this little system, Nintendo would plow money and research into those controllers and sensible. And made sure they worked right. At first, the other companies must have just sat there and laughed. <laughs> this was no serious gaming console, despite the availability of a real controller. But this was not mainly aimed at the serious gamer. This was the technology that was aimed and marketed at the casual gamer and the companies did not realize how large that demand was and it perhaps took Nintendo themselves by surprise. Launched in November of 2006 at £179 whereas an Xbox was 209 and the PlayStation 3 was 425 the Wii sold a whopping 0.4 million units by the end of the year and 4.8 million units in 2007. For comparison, the Xbox sold 1.9 million units in 2007 and the PlayStation 2.56 million. Both Xbox and PlayStation wanted a piece of that pie. To that end, at E3 in November 2009, Microsoft revealed Project Mattel, supported by none less than Steven Bloody Spielberg. This thing was looking like it was going to be great. As Mr. Spielberg said at the presentation, but the vast majority of people are just too intimidated to pick up a game controller. Don and I have always agreed that the only way to bring interactive entertainment to everybody is to make the technology invisible. Fair enough, good intentions. This could bring gaming to a whole new market. Well, for the Xbox, because the Wii had already created it for them. This technology was something they were so very proud of and made bold claims about how it removed the limitations of a controller and put its own far worse limitations in its place. It was going to change the face of the gaming world. So what was this thing? How had it come about? What were Microsoft's claims about it? And what was the reality? What is it actually like to use this thing? Are the claims of games true? Will we use this thing and find out? We will look at the surprising legacy of how, after it became largely defunct in the gaming world, it took on a surprising new life with surprising uses, some of which have helped the lives of thousands upon thousands of people. So Microsoft appear at E3 2009, all excited about this technology. They present a slick show presented by Don Matrick, who does not really have the charisma to pull this off. Instead, coming across as a slimy car salesman and supported by none other than legendary director Steven Spielberg. They show us prototype games such as Racing Game, where you sit and pretend you have a steering wheel, just like these people are pretending they are a model functioning family. You're shown a dinosaur game where the dinosaur is facing forward, so you can't see what's coming at you. They also demonstrated Milo. A creepy AI kid whose soul has been stuffed onto TV by Bill Gates and now will appear in your nightmares forever. Is it a game or a simulation? The AI child shows some really impressive skills including recognising pictures, a human-like level of conversational interaction and the ability to pass things from and to the virtual world and display a range of emotions. Impressive stuff! One thing of note here, can you imagine being the technical guy, hoping this would work? 
probably for the recording of the demo, they did not take any risks. It turns out this footage, unsurprisingly, was pre-rendered, unlike this part, where we got to see perhaps a taste of the reality to come. And Spielberg even went so far as to make this bold claim. And I think what Microsoft is doing is not about reinventing the wheel, it's about no wheel at all. Yes, replacing the wheel in a racing game with fresh air. Good idea, we will talk about that later. As usual, it was all very slick, but what we got in the end, due to some very dubious business decisions we will look at shortly, were much simpler games. The Kinect that would appear on store shelves a year later and go on to be one of the most successful in sales pieces of gaming hardware in history would be far from capable of doing some of the technical feats demonstrated at E3 2009, chalk holding the games into much more basic affairs. But how did that happen? Well, to get to that point, let's look at how all this came about. Microsoft's actual interest in using motion sensing technology for the Xbox actually went back to the early noughties, but the sensing technology was not refined enough at that point. You could argue that it wasn't refined enough at the point of release, but we will leave that discussion for later. In 2006, Alex Kipman, the general manager of incubation at Microsoft, who had been tasked with birthing the Kinect, attended the 2006 Game Developers Conference, where he saw a system being developed by an Israeli company called PrimeSense that used cameras that could map a person's body in front of them and sense their movements. Microsoft began discussions with PrimeSense about making the system more consumer friendly, improve the abilities of the cameras, shrink the system in both size and cost, and a means to manufacture the units at the scale required. One problem the company could not resolve was although it could see the system could see the general outline of a person, it was still unable to track the body. It was during this period that the system, under great secrecy, was shown to a small number of staff at Rare. All the Kinect could see at the time was a depth map. It did not recognise a person with limbs. Microsoft asked Rare if they could do anything with this, and Rare's general opinion was maybe it was too early. At this point, Microsoft, envious about the success of the Wii, for a short while spun off another division to look at developing a handheld motion sensing controller similar to the Wii's. The thinking at the time being that this may ultimately become a standardised form of controller, similar to how two thumbstick controllers have become standardised, but ultimately Microsoft decided they wanted to remove the controller from the player. In 2008, Kuno Fenuda and Darren Bennett, skeleton tracking pioneers, were brought on board and began working with Kipman on a different approach to the skeletal tracking using machine learning. After initial demonstrations of this vastly improving technology to Microsoft executives, they greenlit the project in late 2008, calling it Project Natal, after the Brazilian city where Kipman was born. Because this system would use machine learning, a large aspect of the project was to look at the typical sort of environments where people would be using them, which included both layout and lighting to train the system. To do this, they had to have help from a lot of people who were already using the Wii system to look at their environments. Another issue was that they said, you are the controller. The problem is that people are not produced on a production line. People all react differently, even the task of holding up your hand. People do it at different heights. Some at head height, some at shoulder height. The system had to be trained to recognise all these different instances. Microsoft executives were also faced with the fact that the up and down aspects of the depth sensing camera would either need to be adjusted manually or have an expensive motor to do it automatically. For once, the execs went with a more expensive option, saying that to have it adjust manually would break game immersion. For once, putting game experience over profit. During the development of the Kinect, Microsoft started working with software companies to develop the actual games, one of which would be Good Science Studios, part of Microsoft, who were developing Connected Ventures. One of the games within this was a Reflex Ridge, 
and feedback from the development of that particular game went back into improving the hardware. In January of 2010, in an aim to cut costs and perhaps the decision that would ultimately cause Kinect to flop, would be the decision to remove its own internal processor. Instead, shifting the processing load onto the internal processor of the 360 itself. Also, with the same cost cutting in mind, cheaper cameras with less of a wide field of view were chosen aiming at the American market, where homes tend to be larger, but forgetting about us in the UK and Europe, where the average home is a little more humble. Another victim was the microphone system, which initially could sense your location with reference to the device. This was dropped in favour of just a single microphone. It also meant that games that were going to use more complex controls, such as Steel Battalion, were going to have to deal with less control and lag. This forced a rethinking in Steel Battalion, and they had to program the game to predict what the player would do next in order to get the lag down as much as possible. This simplicity of gameplay was doubled down on by Kipman in the case of Kinect Sports. You see, Kinect Sports was originally going to be a complex sim, where you would become a career athlete with advanced gesture controls. But when Gavin Price, who was a designer at Rare at the time, which was producing Kinect Sports, which initially had more than just the six games that we finally got, including a cricket game, table tennis, rock climbing, and a flying mini games where you flat your arms, got feedback from Don, it said, no, just give us Wii Sports and Kinect. It appears Microsoft, on a mission to make a profit on the Kinect, were now dumbing it down and aiming it squarely at the casual gamer. So here we are one year later at E3 2010, and the games are looking very different as predicted. Core games were adopting the Kinect, but due to the lack of fidelity of the system, they are mainly just adopting it into voice control, which was not really enough to make core gamers want to buy the hardware, just for that functionality. This adoption, even for voice control, came at huge expense to the software houses. Just implementing voice control into Mass Effect 3 took over nine months of development work. With the system not having the fidelity, the gamers didn't want it. And without that demand from gamers, there was no way the software houses were going to put the time and money into finding ways to work it into their games. So the Kinect became the poster child for now for the casual gamer and some surprising applications outside of gaming. But what were these applications? Why did the Kinect ultimately fail? These things we will be looking at later. But first of all, I think it's time to have a look at the experience itself. Looking at the hardware and playing some of the games from its library. Well, out of the box, we get the Kinect itself, a power cable and a cable to go to the Xbox, which is a bit confusing at first, but I got there in the end. Also is your complimentary copy of Kinect Adventures, which is meant to show off the abilities of the system. We will explore this shortly. Now, with the gaming, I thought that, first of all, we would look at the system's flagship launch title, meant to show off its abilities, so you will buy more software and also the number one selling Xbox 360 game ever. Mainly because it was packed in with the Kinect box in a fair few markets. And that is Kinect Adventures. Okay, once you slowly wave at the menu, yes, this would have actually been easier with a controller. The first game you come across is River Rush, and this one is actually quite fun. Once you figure some aspects of it out, silly me could not get airborne enough to hit the targets initially instinctively thinking that you'd have to lean back to get air. Nope, you have to jump. Once I figured this out, I was on the road to some genuine fun. And yes, it is genuinely fun and has lovely graphics with even the camera getting wet. Oh, wow, this is so realistic. <laughs> but I'm not sure outside of multiple people challenging each other how much replayability there is. It's more the kind of game that you play a few times, put away for years before remembering it exists. So you start on a bit of a high, but then comes water leaks and oh dear, what utter dross. The aim of this game is to stand in this glass cubicle, plugging leaks that the fish create as they headbutt the glass. So you find yourself standing there, bored, just moving your hands around to plug these holes. In my own experience, I found one fatal flaw with this game, no matter how much I tried, when a hole appeared in the floor, I could not plug them. 
Even though the Kinect seems to have been able to see my movements and I searched all over the place, I only successfully managed to plug one hole during my attempts. Next comes a rally ball. This is a sort of extremely simplified breakout along a horizontal plane in 3D. The responsiveness of the Kinect in this game seems a little off with quite a bit of lag at times causing the ball to fly past you many times. It's nice that you can block with your body and I many times found this the better tactic. But at some points there is so much flying back at you it's hard to see balls to block. I found the best tactic for me with this was to do the Kinect version of button mashing. Flaming your body around as though you were having a really bad fit. A tactic that led to me actually getting gold in round 2, but at least it gives you a good workout. The next mini game is Bubbles. And this one took me a while to get used to. You start by flapping your arms to get airborne, but then some of the bubbles appear in front of you. My natural instinct, this being a Giro G environment, was to try and paddle forward my arms. Nope, no movement in the game. It turns out eventually that to move forward you step forward. Now that to me at least makes no sense in Zero G. Added to that, that when you need to go down, as far as I can tell, you have to wait for your avatar to drop by itself, which can take a while, resulting in the loss of bubbles. An irritating and ultimately boring game, although I did chuckle at the astronaut going past. The last game in this collection of mini games is Reflex Ridge. This is one of the games that was used in the development of the Kinect technology and it shows. It's quite responsive and fun, although for some reason there seems to be a delay in the jumping, so you'll have to jump sooner than you think. Other than that, dodging, jumping, ducking, and waving your arms around like a madman is quite fun. And this is where Connect Adventures, I think, drops the ball. Here, you have a few games, River Rush and Reflex Ridge. That should sure good promise. It's just a shame that these are basically just short tech demos. There is no depth to these games, no story, nothing to draw you back to them beyond a quick play now and again. If they'd taken these as sort of training levels, developed a story and a world where these newly learned skills will come in use as you progress along a story, perhaps even with an open world instead of basically being a rail shooter, they could have had something. But again, dumb it down. Okay, time for Joyride. Another launch title and another game that suffers from exactly the same problems and another big issue. It was Spielberg that famously said, remove the controller. Although in concept that sounds good, in reality, yes, it's not. Standing there waving your arms in the air with no physical thing to interact with really takes away from the experience and they made it so simple to use because you're stuck in that standing position that you don't have any brake or accelerator, which you could at least do with the remote and its buttons. And that really does draw away from the challenge of the game and make it quite dull. I imagine several hours of holding your hands in the air is going to cause you a few aches and pains the next day. That would make you think twice about playing this one again. Not that there is much to draw you back. Once you've done it, you've done it. As part of the controls, you're meant to pull your arms back to make a boost. But 9 times out of 10, I could not get to do that. And even when I did, I did not realise at first that you only need to quickly lean forward for the boost which meant for a lot of the time I was left leaning forward while the car was making a jump, looking like a right book. This does try a bit extra with the ability to paint your car. I eventually worked out that to choose your colour you have to hold up a colour to the camera, but no matter what I held up, I just gained this pink colour, completely useless. Again with this you just get the feeling you're playing a tech demo than having a true gaming experience. Good for a quick go, but that's it. Now, moving quickly on. When I first got this Kinect, I was informed that what it does really good at is dance games. So let's have a look at one of those. No, not that one. Not yet anyway. Dance Central. And for this, I'm having to replace the music, obviously due to YouTube. One glaring problem straight away is that being an American product and I'm British, this woman I'm supposed to be following is far too stuck up her own ass and energetic in the intros to the songs. Okay, I'm here! Let's do this! I'm so ready to do this thing! 
It's almost driving me to alcohol. Other than that, you have a good tutorial taking you through each step, and I was having fun with that. Together, step, together, step, together, step, together. That's what I'm talking about. Right up until the Kinect decided to crap itself. And no amount of repetition of the movements ended up in it seeing my moves and being satisfied with them. So I gave up on that and moved on to the main dance, which, despite it being my first ever attempt, I did rather well. I had a good geeky workout in the process and quite enjoyed that game. You may see my man boobs bouncing in another video at some point. Another good thing about this game, the menus. Unlike other games where you'll find yourself slowly moving your hand around, trying to get it onto the button, then hold to activate the button, with this one it's really precise as to where it selects on the screen. And to select an option, you don't have to wait like an idiot, you just swipe. Brilliant. I suspect if this technology continued to evolve, this may have become the default control method for menus. Okay, I think it's time to look at one of the other Premiere launch titles, meant to show off the abilities of the system. And that is... Motion Sports! You can tell this game is America is constantly trying to patronise me. It's just had trouble identifying my hand at the bottom of the screen. And now... Great. You're a natural. Moments later, it's called me a bloody natural. Okay, so first of all, horse riding. Very difficult to control, in my experience. I did eventually get the horse to move slightly. Getting going now, but needs to turn it up a notch. The rider has to cue his horse. Only one attempt to jump was successful. And my horse spent most of the time licking the panels at the edge of the arena. Next, we have skiing. Detects you nicely when you push off, but that is the last time you're going to be able to use those sticks. Despite very clearly making the motion, it just flaps them around wildly. What is going on with that camera dribbling around? That's just ugly. Which is a shame as this game has nice graphics and it's one of the few sports games I enjoy playing. So I was looking forward to this. Oh well. Next, gliding. And yes, I enjoyed this. Control was good. It responded naturally to me leaning forward to dive and backwards to slow down. And in general, it was good overall. Like the idea of the track and using the thermals to climb. Mixing in a bit of education there. Again, not a game you come back to again and again, as there's not much to it, but for what it is, I enjoyed it. Apart from having the world's dopiest pilot, Uluk, there's the ground. Instead of getting my legs out, I think I will just crash. Next we're on to boxing. This one genuinely made me giggle. The animations are really funny, especially when you're giving them left and right hooks and yep. This is another easy button mashing game where I found that if you flail your body around, your competitor doesn't stand a chance and you win every time. Just like when I play any retro fighting game I suppose. Yep, it's easy, just another thrown in tech demo with little thought given to it. Next, football. Not something I love, but this one, despite my position being okay for other games on the disc, this one wanted me to step back even further. Something I could not do so I was completely unable to play the game. What a shame. I suspect, though, I did not miss much. Right, American football. Here we go, sports fans. I'm not a sports fan. Shut up! Once again, control issues with this. Ducking was often the most successful, but jumping, due to lag, you had to do really early. And that was only successful if the Kinect even registered you doing it. As it turns out, there was nothing American football about this trash. It's just another jumping and ducking game. Very embarrassing. Have you played Motion Sports? What are your experiences of it? Let us know in the comments, please. Okay, so as we mentioned, some of the core games from the Xbox 360 use the Kinect, and as a result, you would get this better with Kinect written on the box. Now, for reasons discussed earlier, Mass Effect 3 just used this as a voice control system and gave you a few commands. But what did Forza 4 do with it? Well, it turns out you're basically doing the same in this as in Joyride. All it does is replace the controller you waving your arms around, pretending you have a wheel in them. Just like Joyride, because of the basic control system, you lose the ability to brake and accelerate. Part of the fun of the game. This is all done for you. So no, Forza 4 is not better with Kinect. It's shittier with Kinect. Far shittier. So, on to Fighters Uncaged. 
Now, to be honest, before I even play this, I'd seen a review of it as part of another video, and they said that this was supposed to be one of the worst games on the system, so I wasn't going into this expecting much. And it's not a good sign though, that when this starts, even the Kinect hangs its head in shame. This tutorial itself is comprehensive and tedious, showing you how to do moves with both limbs. It could have said that the same move can be made with your left leg, but then I suppose some would complain. The main problem with the tutorial is again the Kinect's lag, Watch but fortunately the guy tells you exactly when he's going to strike. Watch out for my feet! So, as he starts, Keep you need to move, and the timing is generally good. In the tutorial, when the system is expecting uh, you to make certain moves, its recognition is good. It's when it gets to the main fight to it falls apart. With the delay and sometimes the connect not recognizing your moves, it quickly becomes yet another button mashing exercise. I don't feel I need to explain again what this is by now, but just pretend you're being attacked by a swarm of wasps. If I had bought this separately, let's say I would have been disappointed. Hey oh! They should have called it Fighters Caged by This Controller's Lack of Abilities. Okay, on to Rise of Nightmares. Now this was one I was looking forward to, a first person horror game for the Kinect. Interesting to see how this one is controlled. Well, you start off in some kind of prison where you quickly find that somebody has left behind an iron bar to help you escape. How kind of them. You also quickly find out that your companion is irritating as hell. Please, please, you've got to do something. Get us out of here, please. Oh my god, it's broken. And you wish you had the option to lock her in the prison cell behind you so she could constantly shout at just her own company. F this place, let's just get out of here. No such luck. One thing you will also notice, at least in my case, despite the Kinect being calibrated and it's perfectly happy with other games, this one constantly pestered me to get in the play square. Then, despite me not moving, would decide I'm in it again. This is a big problem with the Kinect. Everybody seems to have programmed the sensing themselves. It's a shame it wasn't one universal program that everybody shared. You know, provide some consistency. But what would I know? I'm just a consumer. So how do you move around in a first person shooter with a Kinect? Well, to look around, you twist your shoulders. Fair enough, works well, feels natural. To move forward, you put your leg forward and despite it feeling that you're halfway to posing to the Kinect, it actually feels quite natural. A good idea, or if you get tired of that, you can lift your arm up for autopilot. Another good idea in some situations, such as when you can't work out where you need to go. Fighting in this, despite it being the basic slasher movements, is quite fun, and I did actually come out of the combat sessions with a smile as wide as Grummet's. It's funny that the monsters in this are not really that scary. Maybe it's the noises they make. It makes them sound more like they are drunk people, or people with heavy concussion wearing a metal suit. So after the two of them get squished... Stop! goes back in time and the pair are on a train, with the wife complaining about the man's excessive alcohol consumption, suggesting that men are alcoholics, and I can guarantee you this is just sexist and not the case. So, they have an argument. Kate, hold on. Then he wakes up with a bad head and heads for the bathroom. Cold water will help. Now is it just me, or do I really need to interact to wash my face? Or is this just to give you something to do during the long, seemingly pointless journey down the train? Where you open more doors than do anything else, apart from meet a few characters who really do not add to the story at all. After a while of working our way through what is basically a rail shooter disguised as a train, we come across this chap. No thanks, I'm going. <laughs> Once in the front car, we see his wife being dragged away as seemingly a hostage, and then this monster zombie type thing, which has a potency towards extreme violence. Once 
once a train crashes, you must escape. This is where the control system of this game gives a good experience Whoa. as you move forward, changing Whoa. directions Whoa. and trying to keep your character upright as the train moves beneath. Very nice. Until I came to this section where no matter how hard I tried, I kept dying. Vinoich! Rapide! Gotta move it. The train's not gonna hold. Overall, some potential in this one, despite some seemingly inconsistent swiping in my experience, I may have to return. Have you personally had experience with Kinect games? What does the reality compare to your expectations? Please let us know in the comments. Now, for Kinectimals. It's so cute! It's so cute! I mean, the cuteness is off the scale. If you have kids or you're just wanting a relaxing walk in the park with a cute cub, then this is the game for you. The graphics are stunning in this one and it's a real nice relaxing place to be. Basically, you get to choose your cub. Go learn some tricks with them, such as jump. Let's start easy. Jump in the air. When you do a trick, your cub will copy you. Spin around. That's it. Wow! You two make a great team. And the very cute drop dead. Play dead. Then you go on a treasure hunt. On the way, playing some mini games such as playing ball with your cub. Something I did way too much. Hitting mushrooms with the ball. Or casually throwing pigs at skittles, etc. Yes, it makes sense to somebody, and I was having a good time. Until the Kinect did its trademark and shat itself again. Oh well. Next up, a bit of a treat. The Gun Stringer. Now I'd heard and read a bit about this before going into it, with many people saying it's one of the best games on the Kinect. And I will admit straight away, they weren't wrong. What we have here is a very original and entertaining concept. The game is played as though acted on a theatre stage, and it even begins with live action footage in a theatre, which I believe was the Paramount Theatre in Austin, Texas, where people are watching the show. You play as the gun stranger, an undead marionette sheriff hell-bent on revenge against his posse who have betrayed him. The character is directionally controlled with the left hand, and there really is only left and right to control, so it turns out to be rather simple. Aiming and shooting is done with the right hand pointing around to aim, then quickly raising your arm to shoot, although this does not always work. The game has narration all the way through, making it feel like a cross between a novel and a movie. And the narration is very humorous. Like a hate-filled tornado, the gunstringer swept through the desert. Sparking the end of the line for any man or beast unfortunate enough to wander in his path. The character also talks about this guiding hand that he feels helps him at times. The guiding hand you also see dropping props onto the game now and again, and you will also at times see the audience themselves at the edge of the game, looking on the stage. It's all very entertaining, especially the part where you take out a wounded man. I must say, I prefer the stages where you're moving rather than the static stages, where it can get a bit repetitive, but nothing is perfect. And now, the one you've all been waiting for, the one that arguably the Kinect was bought for by casual and hardcore gamers, Star Wars. It's freaking Star Wars, where you will be able to fight stormtroopers, droids, etc. Rampages of Rancor. Go pod racing. And 
dance. Uh, um, okay. Okay, starting this one up, and we get guidance to each section of what is, for the most part, a collection of mini-games by the usual comedic dynamic duo who introduced the games as part of looking through an archive. Strange, but there you go. First of all, there is the menu. Now, I've seen in some videos people having trouble controlling this. What they seem to have not figured out, which took me a while to figure out myself, is that you can move right by swiping your right hand and left with the old left hand, and then they work fine. So, let's look at Dark Side Rising, which is the main game, the rest really being mini-games. The game starts fair enough, taking you through some training at the temple, where you concentrate on weapons. Very good. Hit the laser directly against your opponent. Very good. You've learned to control your lightsaber. Oh, well, when it's a single move and the system is expecting that, it's not too bad. It's when you get to the parts where you need to do multiple moves that it all falls apart, with either a great amount of lag or it not recognizing your move again. These sections can take a while to get through. Once you finish in the temple, you go down to Kashyyyk to meet Yoda. Be aware of your surroundings. Where it gets to be far more entertaining. Yes, you have to do some basic training to learn movements. You are doing well, young Padua. Almost at the end, we are. But then we get to play with a force, picking up rocks to throw and knock things down, and learning to pick up and manipulate large objects in the game. Feel it, you do. Once this is over, we are attacked by a group of droids who are far too easily dispatched using the figure of eight moves. You use the force. And then we must go to defend the village where the droids are heading. And just for these speed bite sections, it's worth buying this game with its current low cost. It's immense fun leaning the bike over, going through the trees, and the game pulls no punches, and you have to make some quick movements as the trees come thick and fast. Once through the trees, we come onto the water part of the speed bike section. Although this starts on the lake, so not much to avoid. We are quickly attacked, and there's plenty going on. It soon narrows and you end up going over water and land, whilst accelerating and braking to engage the enemies. It very much has the feeling of pod racing. I just wish you had done a version with a traditional controller. Overall, a very good part of the game, and as far as I got on that play. Speaking of pod racing, that is next, and yes, it does feel like the one I played and still play on the N64. You feel like you're in the movie, although with this version, obviously you have no brake or accelerator, and it looks like there is no boost either, which does detract from the experience. There are some nice camera effects as you go through the water, amazing sceneries to fly through with creatures moving around, and what the hell? Overall, not too bad. I'd rather use the original with a proper controller, or go on a speed bike with Yoda, but not too bad for what it is. Rancor Rampage, and this is just dumb. You stomp around destroying houses and throwing people. It's responsive enough apart from the walk itself, which I found very hit and miss, and I think for most people this would only keep you entertained for a few moments. Let's dance off and please don't make me do this. What the hell is this doing in the Star Wars game? Once you've done the first training section of Dark Side Rising, this unlocks Duel of Fates, which you'll quickly wish it hadn't. This thing is based on multiple boring, uncontrollable, repetitive battles against various enemies. It's a complete shambles due to the lag and hit and miss nature of the connect. You just end up flailing your arms around again. I gave up after a few moments. So overall Star Wars I think is worth buying at the low cost it is now. Just for the main game. The pod racing is okay, but the rest, just forget it. Just go have some fun instead with Yoda in the main game. As you can see with this sample of games, the Kinect experience is really a mixed bag. You've got some that control really well, some that control terribly, some that show real innovation, some that are basically shovelware, and some that are incredibly boring. This is like any system really, but with the Kinect, the bad outweighed the good. The hardcore gamer had already been put off by the oversimplistic controls and the fact that you have to stand to play games. Most hardcore games want to relax playing a game and would rather sit in a nice comfy chair, drinking a soda or beer than flailing their arms around like a madman. 
but the writing was already on the wall. In 2008, Apple launched the App Store, where people could download free games onto their iPhone, a wildly successful device, and suddenly the console market was abandoned by casual gamers. Those preferring these simple, quick hit games that they could get for free on a small device in their pocket with an interface. The touchscreen that just worked and became the dominant preferred way to control games over motion sensing. The Kinect was dead, just about. The whole case was not helped by Microsoft's overselling of it in 2009. Yes, it was maybe correct for the vision they had of the system at the time, but by the time it came out, its capabilities were so reduced, people were disappointed with the final product compared to what they had been shown prior. Microsoft did try and force it onto people when they launched the Xbox One, but that is a story for another time. But the Kinect is not dead, for it managed to find uses and applications outside of gaming, such as the production of high quality 3D scans. By using its motion sensing technology, it's able to guide people with exercises for stroke rehabilitation. It's being used to translate sign language. It's even found use in operating theatres. When a surgeon needs to look up information, he can do so with gestures instead of having to touch surfaces, which increases the risk of contamination. You can use them to turn any surface into a touchscreen. They are used in virtual clothes fitting for augmented anatomical overlay for education and to control robots with body movement. Perhaps you know or can think of other uses for the Kinect please leave in the comments. Yes, it may not ultimately have found a home within the gaming world, but it's now found uses in many areas that the people who created it had not imagined. So it's still marching on. <laughs>